gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. As the international elite has made London its home, the private world of luxury interiors is booming. It is absolutely perfect in every way. This is the first stateroom of its kind that's been created from scratch since the war. What their exclusive clientele demand is a home that sets them apart from everyone else. The chandelier was around £180,000, but it'll be the only one in the world in your space. This is petrified moss that's been injected with silicon. Sometimes it produces the smell of real moss. It's not all about showing off, but it's a nice little added bonus that you can say, I've got something you haven't. With the wealthy wanting uniqueness, Britain's artisans are having a creative field day. Oh it's God. absolutely divine. If you went to a, a public aquarium, they wouldn't have the budget for this kind of tank. To make a bespoke scent costs approximately £25,000. That's the starting price. Ooh la la. But as more suppliers muscle in, the competition is increasing. People are watching what you produce. It's going to be seen and people are going to pass judgment on it. I think that if I were to tell you who my clients are, I wouldn't have any clients anymore. Reputations can now hang on a single job. You absolutely cannot fail. It's not even an option that you do whatever it takes to succeed. In the world of luxury interiors, few crafts are as competitive as furniture design. In the exclusive area of Chelsea, New products crowd almost every shop window. Were you looking for anything in particular? Trying to find new supplies, okay. finding new interesting pieces. Fighting for space is Fiona Barrett Campbell, whose designs are inspired by Roman history. OK, so this is the um, House Studs console. There's a fort, an old Roman fort, called House Studs, and that was where this came from. These huge boulders sort of protruding out of the earth. They're all very much statement pieces in their, their own right, but they're not, they're not over the top. I would call them sort of understated statement pieces. To draw in high-end clients, Fiona's shop is laid out like a luxury apartment. This cabinet, that starts at 14,000. That's about 7,000 pounds, including that. Um, we sold quite a few for chalets. Yeah. yeah. What is this one here? What's the oh, wallpaper? Yeah, it's oh, it's cork. Yeah. To complete the picture, even the walls ooze bespoke finishes. So it's specialist plaster, and it's a, a diamond design. Um, it's all done by hand. It takes about three or four days to do that. Aztec, someone said. Aztec. <laughs> yeah. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. No, thank, thank you. Thank you. The market now is extremely competitive, so you have to be constantly trying to develop new finishes, to find new materials to work with, different ways to work with them, to try and be one step ahead of your competitors, to be offering something different. But as more designers arrive in London, a shop is no longer enough for Fiona's ambitions. So for the last two years, she spent millions renovating a warehouse in Victoria. Steve, where are the decorators? I think these are just phantom decorators. No, they're not here. I'm slightly worried about these leaning against this, this woodwork here, because they are pretty. Her plan is to create London's first super luxury showroom, where top designers can show off their wares alongside Fiona's own exclusive furniture. We've got C75 for the tops in there. It's the best of everything. I'm talking about the quality of materials, quality of workmanship, quality of design and finishing. All those elements come together to make something that is really visually stunning. You've got to show people what you can do. 
Barrett, spelt B A R R A T. Fiona's business comprises half a dozen young designers, Alison, the PA, and her husband, the former England football captain, Sol Campbell. This is a you know, huge project for us, massive projects, massive. You know, for me, it's all about game changing, really. You know, sort of bring the sporting element into it. Down. Down. It's all about putting your flag in, in the ground and saying, here we are, you know, we want to, uh, you know, we want a piece of the pie or a slice of the cake. Fiona has thrown everything at the showroom, right down to the silver porcelain wallpaper. It's not paper. It's not paper. It's, it's cloth. cloth. It's cloth. This is actually like trying to put a, a skinned rhino up on the wall. How much is this, is this worth? Price, price on application. That's, that's the if thing. If you need to ask, ask you, can't you can't afford, afford it. it. <laughs> the craftsmen have been sourced from across the continent. We're not plasters, we are artists. What we do, uh, it's, uh, it's very artistic and very, very creative. Alison, sorry, Mandy's left a load of rubbish in the bin up here. It doesn't look good. Uh, but after two years of work, Fiona now faces an unusual deadline. The showroom must be completed before her third child is due, in only two weeks. We're pushing to get the job done now, so we've got lots of people who shouldn't be here, who should have finished and left, and it should be a little bit cleaner. And this is obviously, you know, finished, bespoke joinery, which shouldn't be in this condition, <laughs> basically. I'm sure it's going to send me into early labour at some point. With the super rich on a spending spree, the luxury design world is expanding fast. Exclusivity has trickled down to even the most mundane household items. This man is a regular visitor to the Savoy Hotel. His business depends upon it. I'm a man who is simply obsessed with beds. Alistair Hughes runs Savoir Beds, a business which began by making beds exclusively for the Savoy. Alistair now exports around the world. When you're dealing with these clients who have so much money, who can have every luxury imaginable, sometimes you have to start with things that are much more common and close to them and right under their nose. Alistair does a regular service on every mattress in this hotel. We can see here we've got a very small tear. Hi, is that any game? But I think what we need to do is just swap that mattress over as quickly as possible. So can you see what we can do in terms of getting a replacement in? If you want to work at this end of the market, you really have to be a little bit obsessive about quality. If we don't do that, we'll always be someone else who does. Alistair's beds are made in a London warehouse and can cost up to £60,000. Even his dog has a Savoir mattress. We've got other beds here waiting to go out to the state. So, well, up here we've got the yacht beds, so all the thin ones up here. On yachts we tend to make very narrow mattresses. The forgotten beds are mainly down the other end here. The forgotten beds tend to be things where either a house project has taken massively longer than expected, um, possibly a divorce has happened in the middle. Uh, of course, divorce is normally quite good for our industry, I hate to say it, but when people separate, they usually end up with a new bed. Um, so uh, it can be a good time for us. Each one of his beds is uniquely designed for his clients' needs. People use beds in very different ways. Headboards with secret compartments where you can keep a handgun, OK, not for this country, I might add. That was uh, a US client who wanted that. Um, we've also had secret drawers for things like jewellery. Um, so people like to sleep close to what's close to them, I suppose. We actually have had beds bought as gifts for people who are reaching the end of their life. I've never had someone come to me and say, it's for me, I'm going to die in it. But I've had people come to me and say, look, this person who's been so special to me, I want them to go out feeling comfortable. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Did you have a nice trip? <laughs> oui. <laughs> oui. 
Alistair's newest clients are Sasha Volkov and Pascal Ferrero, a couple whose love of objects has created a unique Parisian apartment. So here is the, the living room with the new, a few new pieces. Pascal is France's most celebrated wig maker. Sasha, a fashion designer who's previously collaborated with Savoir Beds. If you're a designer like the one I want to be, you have to be different. I mean, you, you need to, to, to bring to the people you're working with something that is unique. After months adorning their flat with body parts and stuffed animals, one piece of furniture now seems rather bland. The, the problem is that we need a new bed. We really need a we new really bed. We really need a new bed because um, the bed is quite minimal, like a student bed, <laughs> and we are not students not anymore. anymore. <laughs> so we decided we had to invest in the bed. As bespoke becomes the watchword in luxury, the elite will seemingly stop at nothing to make their homes unique. In London, one man can even make the air that you breathe exclusive to you. Mmm, fish and perfume. What could be better? Caviar and cleaning fluid. Oh, and the smell of feces. Something utterly fecal, disgusting. Ugh. Roger Dove is one of the country's leading scent creators. Oh, bad! Horrible. You're wearing patchouli? I can smell it outside, it smells fantastic. Yeah, it's lovely, delicious, I'm a perfumer. But it's gorgeous, very nice. <laughs> Funny. For me, the smell of luxury is something which absolutely doesn't try. A really luxurious scent should have presence, it should be memorable, but it shouldn't shout. Nothing luxurious should shout. In a quiet space in Mayfair, Roger creates bespoke home fragrances using only the rarest of ingredients. This is called ambergris. It comes from the sperm whale. The sperm whale forms it in its throat and a little bit like a cat honking up a fur ball, it's going to boom, expel it and it will float on the ocean. And when fishermen collect it in their nets, they're very, very happy because this raw material when it's finished, will cost nearly £100,000 a kilo, or 10 times the price of gold. So to make a bespoke scent costs approximately £25,000. That's the starting price. The majority of my clients aren't surprised by the price at all. Lots of people, when they just hear it, if they've never contemplated it before, of course, it's a fortune, I understand that. But I think what people need to stop to think about, when I make a scent for somebody, I can sell it once. Roger's minimum order is 500 scented candles. So his clients tend to live in rather large houses. Baloo! Goretti! Come on, Shai, come on, Baloo! Hold on, let me call her and tell her to take him off the lead. Goretti, do you want to take Baloo off the leash, please, so let them run in? Ida Delal is an Iranian businesswoman who has spent eight years restoring Fawley Court. Even in its most horrific condition, which is what it was when I got here, you could still see how it must have been really beautiful in the past. Ida now wants a scent to mark the completion of her home's ground floor. I hope that the scent will be as relevant as the, my restoration here has been. That it's, a, it's a modern scent, but with some very simple, classical notes to it. So, I think Roger has a hell of a challenge on his hands. For the global elite, having a bespoke interior allows certain messages to be conveyed to your guests. Why have normal taps when they could be encrusted with your favourite jewels? In South London, one company's product is used to make a very different statement. Keep going down another six inches. Keep going, keep going. And down again. Perfect, you've got it. You can almost stereotype what kind of aquarium they would like depending on their nationality. Like the Russians, they love the big, teethy, predatory fish. 
um, the Americans. They love the huge systems, of course. This tank itself to install would be around probably the £100,000 mark, and that's before you've even added the fish. Aquarium Architecture's tanks transformed luxury living rooms. I would say it's, it's unique. If, if you went to a, a public aquarium or a, or, a, or a zoo, they wouldn't have the budget for this kind of tank. Aquariums, it seems, satisfy a personality trait amongst the very wealthy. The rich and wealthy like being in control of what they have. These clients, they're playing God with these fish. They can create whatever they like, and I think that just appeals to these kinds of people. This probably weighs about 200 kilos. Do not drop it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go back, go back, go back. Go back, go back, go back. In North London, their latest tank is being installed for a new client. You need to come, come back, come back. Come towards. Oh, well done, boys. Oh, Jesus Christ. He's requested rather unusual fish. We've got some guidance from the client as to what fish he wants in there and is looking for aggressive, brutish-looking fish. What, what does he think about eels? Aggressive, but too aggressive. Too aggressive, I think. Generally, our clients come to us with a very vague idea of what it is that they want. Select the best. The kind of situation that you want to avoid is where the client is desperate to have piranhas, but also desperate to have guppies in there with them, which is not something that you can make work, because fundamentally a piranha is going to eat other fish. In fact, they'll eat each other. For the high-end client, a product's value is best measured by its uniqueness rather than its price. For some, spending £30,000 on a bed can make sense, if that bed fits only you. Sasha, how, how are, are you? you? Pascal. Pascal, nice to meet you. Nice how are you? Meet you too. What we obviously want to do is fit you with the right bed. We hope so. Yeah, that's the key yeah, yeah we came for that. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Every customer has to be fitted for their Savoir bed because every spring is shaped to the owner's body. So I think what we should do is just try you on a few other beds. Just tell me how you feel on them, what you think of it. This mattress is clearly not the right mattress for you. It's actually bending your spine out of line. So how does it feel? It's like I am on the cloud. You want to be floating in air. In between floating and have a massage. People use beds in very different ways. For some people, it's a, a, a place for all-night sex. For others, it's somewhere where we just go for a kip. Bed for me is really to sleep and to have the better sleep you can have. But for him, it's just like an island. Yeah, and it's true. his island. He does everything in bed. Yeah. We we'll never argue, but I mean, sometimes he's like, now stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's now we sleep. Now, <laughs> connecting A little out. bit more. <laughs> I have this more email to answer that. Tomorrow. <laughs> it's very nice, all those. Sasha and Pascal's bed is so important to them, they're designing the headboard themselves. Oh, look at that. Leather? The colours are amazing. Hmm. Sasha? And I'm not sure about the place for the bed right now. Maybe in, in ten years. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. Oh, this yeah. one I like. Provence, I like. So maybe we could go for green, because this is quite nice, because this, this is quite masculine. Yeah. I quite like that one. The general idea would be like this, with all those shelves. I mean, we have, like, thousands of books, so I thought that the headboard looking like a kind of library shelves. Makes it alive. Different is good. I mean, I think that it would be very boring to have a world with all people looking alike and thinking the same thing. It would be terrible. This is where Pascal is sleeping, and I'm <laughs> sleeping here. You will look even smaller, I will look even bigger. I, I don't need to be taller than yeah. I am, so I'm yeah. quite good. So there's no problem. You can laugh and about. I, yeah, and I like, to, I like small guys. So. <laughs> the no reason why I want, to, I want him to be even smaller. Yeah, more smaller. <laughs> <laughs> At a country house in Northumberland, 
Fiona has just one week until her baby is due. Dawn, are you finished in there? Oh, right, can we just move this so we can film in the bedroom? Yeah. Can I just check the bed before we go in there? Just check that everything's... The only thing I have to take <laughs> No, no! <laughs> I'm very particular about the way I put my cushions. <laughs> it's OCD designer paranoia. <laughs> this is the games room in here. He's very photogenic. He ages very well, <laughs> annoyingly. <laughs> so we've got four bedrooms, three bathrooms on this floor. You can see here's more of the um, strips. The sedan, yeah. Fiona's spent several years and millions of pounds renovating this house. But with the business expanding, she's decided to sell. We can't justify having such a huge property in the northeast. You know, if I'm at home with the children, I'm at home with the children, but otherwise I want to be in work and I want to be industrious and I want to be doing stuff and it becomes like a drug, it becomes addictive. You can't stop. I think we're going to have to get it fixed and take a view on it and just make sure that everyone is prepared that if, it, if I'm not happy and it doesn't work, come back. Fiona's family background helps explain her work ethic. Her grandfather founded Barrett Homes. In the beginning, it was very difficult. I have the Barrett name, which people associated with the lower budget housing, but then also I married a footballer. Straight to camera this time. You know, footballer's wife, I was just doing this as a little sideline that sold set me up or something, you know, the little business. But it's, you know, it's, it's not that. And when you have people in your family who've been very successful, my parents and my grandfather, you do feel like that you need to follow suit. There is a, there is a pressure there that you can't fail. You absolutely cannot fail. It's not even an option. That you do whatever it takes to succeed. John Butteridge. Now, if you lift that up and that's ladies on the knees. Sorry. Back in her luxury showroom, Fiona has brought in £100,000 worth of sculptured lighting. And this light here is all hand-blown glass. You can customise the finishes. You can have the rope and a cream. You can have the glass in different colour. Um, but Sol wanted something different over his desk. Oh, this is his choice? Yes. It's quite a statement light, isn't it? It is, but he's kind of a statement guy. <laughs> Her plan is for a grand showroom opening in a week's time but only once the baby is born. I'm having a baby tomorrow. <laughs> well, it's my due date tomorrow. Um, so that's why we have to be in the office, because <laughs> it's too stressful to, <laughs> to, do, to have, it, have the move after the baby. If you're going to have that one up today, are you going to have that up by the end of tomorrow? If everything goes OK, I will be back at work next week with the baby. In the world of luxury interiors, Roger Dove is pioneering the bespoke home fragrance. And like any high-end artisan, to perfect the product, he has to know his client inside out. When looking at scent for a home, you have to take into account the personality of the person. It isn't me sort of looking at you like some psychic, thinking, ooh, blah, 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 what do I know? I need to discover it. So Roger is off to profile Ida Delal's sense of smell. We have around 3,000 raw materials we can draw on. I will start to introduce her to different oils. I've always said that I don't listen really very much to what people say. I observe how they behave. Grass. It smells just of wet grass. Hello. How are How you? Very, very nice, nice to meet you. And you, you too, my sister. Really so... lovely to see you. I can't be there. <laughs> Roger's analysis begins with a meticulous tour of Ida's habitat. When you walk into the room, you really smell the wood yeah, in this room. Gorgeous. 
How lovely. Um, I don't want to walk on the grass if you don't mind. I have silk shoes on. Yeah, that's why I'm <laughs> And Ida has very fine shoes on. <laughs> I love this smell of decay that you always get on the woodland floor. And it smells slightly camphoraceous. You lived originally in Persia, in yes, Iran. Yes, I was born there. Were there particular smells that you missed from home? Well, I think there are definitely cooking smells, because Persian food is, is a great mix of spices and mm -hmm. vegetables. And very aromatic. And very aromatic. People either love it or can't stand it. Of course, scent for a home is no different than scent for, for ourselves, that you can send messages off with scents. So if you walk into a house and the scent inside it is sort of very fruity and sugary, you might say that it suggests somebody who's fun and playful. You could also say that it might suggest somebody who is very unsophisticated. Please come and have a seat here. And so what I'm going to do is introduce you to a lot of different odours. And you have to do nothing other than smell and tell me what you think. And what that allows me to do is get a, a picture or an understanding of the sort of scents that you really, really like. So there's the first one, and let's start. So whatever you feel. It really reminds me of my childhood. It makes you think of your childhood? Yeah. It smells like a vanilla pepper. Oh, seriously, pungent. <laughs> so what is that one? Might sound a little bit odd, but um, the odour exists in faeces. So a whisper of it, really hidden, is very erogenous. Mm. Too much of it is totally offensive. Mm -hmm. They really have to be handled with care. Mm. <laughs> mm. I always say scent's a little bit like a cat burglar. It can sort of creep up on you when you're not expecting it. And it breaks into our subconscious and it opens the most wonderful doors, doors of memory. My late father's aftershave. Ida will sniff over 120 odours, from geranium to beard of goat, before Roger finally reaches a verdict. If you want to know a little bit about your style in scent, you seem to like um, the feeling of warmth in scent, very, very mossy uh, feel. You really seem not to like sweetness. So it'll be very, very interesting to see where I start uh, to create the scent for your home. It's been lovely. How about this? <laughs> the scent needs to be a very classical structure, I think, but it needs to have this, this quirkiness, this brightness, this unusual twist without being gimmicky because one thing I don't think she is in any way, shape or form is gimmicky. And as a perfumer, nor am I. Also pursuing a bespoke project, aquarium architecture are in Holland, where one warehouse sells everything from seahorses to sharks. Definitely a, a male thing. They've got the fast cars, they've got the big house, you know, they've got their boats or whatever else. The next thing is a shark. I don't own a, own a shark and I'm a, I'm all man. With a budget running into the thousands, the team must find exactly the right size and ugliness of fish. One of those more eels, they can like rip a finger off. It's ugly enough to go in the tank, but I would be worried that he'd make a light snack of any smaller fish that they get put in. There's lots of ugly fish here, you know, things like big eyes, but not going to cut it. They're not, not scary or, uh, or ugly enough. Under the patronage of the wealthy, the aquarium industry has boomed. Rare fish now sell for eye-watering prices. This is the pair of kingi. How much do they get for? I think it will be around 60,000 a pair, I think. Yeah. Oh, you'd have to be very committed to your fish keeping to want to buy a pair of those. It's just on a whole other scale, the amount of money that can be spent creating your dream marine tank. To some people, they're just living creatures in the sea, but it's unlimited, really. Like, if you have a blank check, you could spend it. <laughs> but despite picking up £5,000 worth of coral, the team haven't found any fish aggressive or ugly enough. It needs the owner to step in. So uh, we've just been told there's a there's a secret room, an Aladdin's cave, if you will, uh, of 
some more rare fish that we are yet to see. I've, I've been here previously a few times and uh, I've never known it's existed till now. Wherever they are. Camera shot. Jesus Christ almighty. Oh my God. It's not every day that you get to uh, see behind the scenes at a place like this. That's pretty damn cool. But the hammerhead shark is sadly as long as the tank they're trying to fill. People hire us because they know they're getting the best. And so we're the same. We want to supply them with, you know, the best aquariums with the best fish. And if that means, you know, we have to come all the way to Holland and not find quite what, you know, the client's looking for, then so be it. So uh, it's back to London for us. It's three days after the birth of Fiona's child, and sticking to schedule, she's back at work. That's gonna wake the baby. If you're gonna stand, will you close the door? Yeah, fine. I'm either sat at home doing nothing because the other two are in nursery and school, so I might as well be at work. <laughs> oh, pardon you. I think we're going to have enough nappies for you. It's quite funny driving to work, just talking to the baby, and it's like, and this is rush hour. <laughs> Getting the work ethic instilled really young. <laughs> Why don't you call her and ask if she could work late so she could do mm -hmm. eight till two at our house, mm -hmm. maybe? Nowadays, opportunities can be too easy for the younger generation, and I think, you know, they, they've still got to realise that you've got to work hard. You know, it is tough in business. Right, let's go see how Ray's doing. After two and a half years, Fiona's showroom is finally complete. Its centrepiece is a £200,000 kitchen with white bronze cupboards. These were, gosh, 15000 for these doors, you know, but they are something special. Everybody that walks into the showroom, the first thing they do is touch these and go, wow, what is that? And that's what you want, you want people to engage with the design. But Fiona won't relax quite yet. In a few days, her showroom will have a public opening, attended by most of her competitors. You're going to get some people who love it, you're going to get some people who don't love it, and everyone is entitled to their opinion. But for me, the worst response that somebody could give is to, to give no response at all, because how do you respond to nothing? OK, I'll get Paolo now, actually, to have a look at that. Across in Alistair's factory, Sasha and Pascal's unique bed is nearing completion. Essentially what we put together is a, a mattress here in one piece, which each side is different and designed for one side for Pascal, the other for Sasha. So on Pascal's side, we've got all soft springs. Sasha was a little bit more difficult. What he needed was something where he could actually sit up in bed and read, but also be comfortable when he's lying down. That meant we needed something a little bit firmer at the top end. So it's totally bespoke. We'll probably never make another one like this again. Why would we? It depends on the combination of people. Their £30,000 bed is hand-stitched from start to finish by veteran bed maker TJ. This is all done by hand, and the way you feel. The way I feel, I got up in the morning and I feel good about myself. So when I feel good about myself, I'll come and put all my energy and all my goodwill into this bed. And the person who lie in the bed would feel the energy. Okay? <laughs> That's it. We employ total 90 people, 65 of which are craftspeople. And if we're going to have a manufacturing base in this country, I believe it's only going to be with the very best quality. There's no question that people love to hate and ridicule the super rich, but actually, through their spending, what they do is they help to fuel our renaissance. They help to keep businesses like us going. I think we have to get rid of all those books. Maybe. Preparing the nest. I'm feeling quite nervous because if it doesn't fit, it goes back to London. 
I'm not nervous because he's nervous, but I'm waiting to see things. Sasha and Pascal's bed is the crowning piece in a flat where price will always come second to originality. We have very demanding jobs, both of us. Many times we can spend two or three weeks without seeing each other. Oh, ooh la la, masterpiece. I, I really love to be in a place and I see things that I love and I think they go well together and it makes me happy. You know, it's better to wake up in a place like this than to wake up in a shitty place. <laughs> Ready? Oh, oh la la, c'est huge. Oh, oh la la! You have to speak oh. in English. Yes, sorry, I'm, huge is English. It's <laughs> Wow. <gasps> it's a world. <laughs> it's an old world. <laughs> oh my God. I must say, yeah, it's amazing. Oh, la la. Good night. Bye-bye. I can't do this because I'm going to sleep in a minute. <laughs> the ultimate luxury is to be in love and to be loved in return. And that's what we have together. And it's great to have it. It's a plus. It's a plus, exactly. It's a plus. It's a <laughs> but the main important thing is this. The rest is like bullshit. <laughs> Roger Dove is back in Mayfair, preparing for a first attempt on Ida Delal's home fragrance. I need to make almost a rough sketch of the perfume. This is a very particular type of geranium. It's called geranium bourbon. That's going to be a little bit of nostalgia for her because it reminded her immediately of her, of her father. This is the rose from the south of France. I think the last time I paid about 23 or 24,000 pounds for a kilo. But that comes across as very inexpensive compared to the jasmine I just used. It takes around five million flowers picked by hand before the sunlight touches them to produce one kilo of the oil. And that costs 34,000 pound a kilo, which is just over, I believe, double the price of gold bullion. We're painting pictures, but we just don't use paint. We're telling stories and poems, but we just don't use words. So what I'm doing is allowing these raw materials to express my idea, my vision, like a poet or a storyteller, uh, but just using the language of smell. I like it. So I think that I am actually ready to weigh it out. This for me is always uh, one of the most frightening moments because of course every time I put an oil inside uh, the container I can't remove it. So it really is the point of no return. Roger's ingredients are so rare that creating 500 candles could take up to two years. But only once Ida is happy with the smell. What I think I've managed to capture is something which is rich and opulent, but not in the least showy. It has the smell of the woods that run down to the River Thames. It has all the warmth and the softness that I hoped. Well, if she doesn't love it, I'll have it at home. Roger's creation might work as a perfume, but the odour will change when it burns. And even then, it needs to complement the smell of Ida's house. Balloon, bye! Come on! Hello. Hello, Roger. How lovely to see you. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for turning the rain on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. So how's everything with you? I'm so excited about today. Likewise. Yeah. Well, it's really fascinating to see your interpretation of it all. I think we're going to go through to the go library. Yes. Lovely. How exciting is this? Wow. 
I love your presentation. Thank um, you. There are some very, very discreet, ultra-luxurious materials in the base, which maybe I can say that this is the only candle on earth that has them in. It's super exciting. Really. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. I have no idea at the moment whether it will smoke, whether it will burn evenly, whether the scent will lift. We'll find out together. Yes, yeah, so now becomes the beginning of, uh, of that journey. Right, Roger, the moment of truth <laughs> has arrived. The moment of truth. You like it? Mm, it's beautiful. It's you like stunning. It? Yeah, I love it. It's quite a complex smell. It's not an ordinary candle. No, I it's can see that's that. That's for sure. <laughs> and I don't know if you can catch, there's a little touch of foliage in there. Mm -hmm. You um, can catch that. Can you catch yeah, it? you can catch that. How does it make you feel? I think it's an everlasting scent for Foley. Thank you, Roger. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, Fiona Barrett Campbell is opening her showroom. There's no nerves. The sales team is on high alert. We've got everything printed, everything's ready. We are very organised, that's one thing. Even though we don't look it yeah. at the moment, we are very organised. When people walk in here tonight, I hope that it's um, a good reaction. People are wowed by the space and the the product that we've produced. Yeah, so if somebody wants more information on the kitchens, just take down their information, write a note onto it, and then you can give that to Georgina. Put it down here. Put it down here. Maybe. I think, I think, easy tiger. Excited and nervous. Um, I think it's all those feelings, really. Anticipation, you know. Right. It's an important night for us. It's a very yeah. important night for us. Yeah. And if it goes well, what would this kind of success look like? <laughs> What's going to hat trick? <laughs> the guest list of investors and Fiona's competitors are seeing the kitchen for the first time. Oh my God. It's absolutely oh, it's Again, there's a storage again. I just really love the fact that it's like a very practical device. You know, it's a gas hob, but why shouldn't everyone have a beautiful gas hob? Um, you know, it's more like a piece of sculpture. I know, she doesn't even look like hey. she's had a baby. It's a girl, we have another girl. I think a lot of people that buy this have chefs um, who would know what to do with it anyway. Um, but this is definitely the top end of the market. In a, in a nice mansion, which it would have to be with a, with a kitchen this size, I think it could be quite homely. But for Fiona, exhaustion is finally catching up. I feel really tired now, yeah, um, it's been a long day, it's been a long year. <laughs> I just have time to try and get everyone to go home now. <laughs> yeah, well, I have time to stop serving alcohol. Alison sees that Property is a very male-dominated industry and you have to be strong. You have to have conviction in, in all the decisions that you make um, and you do have to stand your ground. It's hard for the modern day working mother. It is. Six weeks after their unsuccessful trip to Holland, the men of aquarium architecture have found the right fish. We've looked at thousands and thousands of fish, um, trying to keep the client happy. Um, and actually, we've dwindled them thousands down to, you know, half a dozen for now. Nothing, nothing about price here. It's all about getting the, the very top, top stuff. The fish they've sourced are a unique combination of rare, aggressive, and profoundly ugly. Always be careful with puffer fish because whenever you take them out of the water, whenever you stress them out, they just fire up. The puffer fish has a beak, um, and that will just chop your finger off. Um, and the trigger fish has visible teeth, which could just go straight through your flesh. It's a tassel firefish. Never 
Fisher isn't too common. The long-awaited lionfish, they are venomous and they will, will make you very sick. An adult one could, could kill you. This tank will cost thousands to maintain each year, as it's such a rare mix of species. Do you want to bat the lionfish away, Sam? For the client, that perhaps is the point of it all. Not everyone has a great big fish tank full of predatory, dangerous fish in their, in their homes. And so when the client has his friends round, he can, you know, show off and say, this fish will, you know, bite your finger off or this fish could give you a pretty fatal sting. It's not all about showing off, but it's definitely something that, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a ni nice little added bonus that you can say, I've got something you haven't. This will be all gold as well. And then the little, this little bit at the bottom, the base here, in uh, chocolate wood. For all craftsmen in the luxury sector, whether it's fish, fragrance or furniture, success often depends simply on creating their clients' unique fantasies. Right, so next project, we have a Hindu philanthropist who wants an aquarium. Now, he has stated a preference for having vegetarian fish in order to suit his vegetarian lifestyle. There's a lot of good-looking vegetarian fish. More often than not, for the super-rich, the only limit is their own imagination. Oh, look at that. I think as long as people want to be seen to be superior or to have something which no one else has, because that's what's important, is to be different, then I think we'll always have a market for what we sell. 